Welcome back. Now, during this month of March, when we celebrate extraordinary women, we sought to speak with influential women in the political, social, corporate and business spheres and bring you insights of their journeys that would inspire and challenge you. Starting off our series tonight is Sylvia Mulinge, Safaricom's chief customer officer. She is a force to be reckoned with in Kenya's corporate space, steadily climbing the corporate ladder to become one of corporate Kenya's most powerful women. So how did she do it? We leave you now with her insights. You know, Sylvia, we go through our careers, through our lives, and you know, forget some of the things that we went through in terms of obstacles. What were some things that you were told earlier in your career that could have been barriers, but somehow you found a way of overcoming? I think a lot, I'm, I'm blessed because uh, a lot of this, the stuff that I had uh, when I was growing up was very affirming for me, uh, from my parents, uh, my family, and everyone who was around me. Um, I'm a firstborn in a family of five, so my father was always pushing me to do better together with uh, my mom, uh, to excel in everything that I set my heart to do. Um, I went to a school in, um, in uh, Nakuru, and uh, when I was there, uh, we, I mean, I got involved in a lot of different things. But one of the things that I probably remember um, that was, well, first of all, for my dad, he always used to tell me, you have to do the very best uh, that you can in school. Um, you have to be at the top, right? So which always pushed me and I guess built a spirit of um, wanting to pursue excellence in everything that I found myself doing. Um, I guess I, I never had the inhibition that I could not do anything that a, a, that a man uh, could do. Um, and that's because uh, I guess my parents and the places where I found myself created the room for me to be able to, to walk there into there with a lot of confidence, believing that I could. Uh, but one of the things that I guess as I grew up <clears throat> and started my career, um, looking at, uh, you know, I, I went to, to University of Nairobi. I, I graduated in a, with a degree in a Bachelor of Science in Food Science. Um, and when I went for my first like real job interview, uh, which was in Unilever, it was a management trainee position. One of the things that I thought that I, for me to be able to get in is that I needed to have the right credentials, right? That I needed to be able to tick everything in the requirement list, list that had been provided for the, for the job. But I guess what I've progressively come to learn, that it's not really about, your credentials are important. And it's important to go to school and it's important to, um, to just qualify yourself in the, in the profession that you want to pursue. But I think the most important thing is to believe that you have the capacity to be able to pursue the dream and the road that is opening up for you, which I think is something that really limits a lot of us as women because um, I read somewhere somebody said that the other day that we, men judge themselves based on capacity, women judge themselves based on ability. And ability is about, do, have I met the right credentials? You know, have I met all the requirements for this role? Um, and then if I've, not, I've only met 90% of them as a woman, I said, oh, I don't think I can qualify. Men look at things very differently. They look at it and say, even though I don't have the credentials, do I believe I have the capacity? to actually get this done. And I think for me that has been um, kind of uh, what has defined my journey. Today I'm a commercial leader, but I never went to school to train for, for a sales and marketing uh, kind of a degree. Everything I learned was just by being courageous enough to take the opportunities that came in front of me, jump into them, and then pursue and do my very best. And this is why I find myself in the place where I am today. So really showing the power of belief. Power of belief, yes. In, in your journey. Well, let's talk about unconscious bias. You know, this, these are the little things that have come in and lingered their way into the workspace. And, you know, you come in thinking you've got this, you're ready to perform, and you meet prejudices and stereotypes. How did you navigate through the workspace and, and deal with those unconscious biases? Um... There's a very important role that parents play in their children's lives because you either affirm those unconscious biases or you create a different environment where you probably, when those, even those, when those biases exist, you don't get to see them, right? So, for example, um, I'd, I'd never walk into a situation thinking that because of, I'm a woman, I can't and a man can do better. I am conscious that probably as a woman, I have to punch a little harder um, because probably I have many other responsibilities that probably a man does not have outside the work ecosystem, right, or work environment. So balancing it all requires me um, uh, to probably apply myself a little more. I have to build the right support ecosystems to make sure that I'm, I'm successful. 
successful. But also being alive to the fact that um, when you come into a room, sometimes all you have is yourself, right? Um, and building there from yourself and whatever has brought you to this place being your majority, then now everything else becomes um, additional. So even if you come and find people with uh, different um, biases, uh, whether it's because of the way they were brought up or the kind of cultures that they come from, um, starting off from the point of I am me and myself and whatever it is that you believe in already a majority is a good starting point right to help you uh, to be able then to begin to scale up um, you will find a conscious biases around uh, because you're a woman really can you I mean because you're a woman what is it that you can tell me um, I was sharing there's a colleague was sharing with me about a week, at, a week ago about how she went into a boardroom and she's a she's a senior me member of society and they told her you know you need to behave like a woman you need to be a girl I mean, just basically trying to put you back into your position. Um, I, I believe um, as the world uh, becomes, I guess, more knowledgeable, uh, we have more access to information today. People are beginning to appreciate the role that women have to play. Uh, the anthemic calls that we have, for example, I uh, create this Better for Balance, is making people a lot more um, enlightened. And um, I read somewhere the other day that said that it takes enlightened men and brave women to be able to change the world. So as our men become a lot more enlightened and begin to appreciate the value that women bring, and our women then become, myself included, become more courageous and brave to be able to step up to the plate and overcome these unconscious biases and actually chart a different path and show that they can actually be, this, there's a lot that women can, can be able to contribute. Then we begin to change the world and overcome these biases. But the biases are there. We have to be aware of them. Uh, was a trick that I learned uh, in the early days of my career is that even when you see someone with a bias, don't see the person, try and understand what is behind them that is causing them to behave the way they do. It has helped me as a woman to kind of set aside the emotional baggage and just focus on the issue at hand. And speaking of which, how do you deal with the issue of balancing your femininity and still being a woman leader? You know, many of the leadership qualities oftentimes are seen as inherently male. Uh, but when you're a woman in the boardroom, how do you find that balance? I think those qualities have to do, first of all, with you owning your space and um, the environment uh, that you've been given or the opportunity that you've been given. So, first of all, being confident that the road that has led you here has prepared you for the moment that you find yourself in. So, number one, you're enough right just that self-affirmation that the fact that i've been given a seat at the table means that i am enough it doesn't mean that i don't continue to work on myself but i don't really come into the conversation from a back foot saying that i probably do not have everything that is required for this role then the second thing is just be confident um i you know confidence is a is a woman's great greatest asset and the thing that she wears best um if you're confident you know we you, you know as i said earlier sometimes we as women you go into a conversation everybody in the room is sounding smart so when you come into a room you have to come into a room and the first thing is that you have to own the space right and be confident that you're in that you're enough that the journey that has led you here and the road that has gotten you here has prepared you for this moment so on the moment be confident in it and, and and know that you're enough. Uh, secondly, be confident, right? After you affirm yourself, uh, be confident. Be confident to speak. Be confident to raise your hand. Be confident to be curious. Be confident could, to say, is there another way? Could there be another possibility of looking at this situation? Um, and just speak. If we don't raise our voices, um, in the world that we're living in today, a lot more room is being made for women. And even in the place where I work, our CEO and the leadership team are really committed to ensuring that we achieve that gender balance um, in our senior management. We're currently at 34%, want to get 50% by in the next two years. But if that room is made and women in the space that has been created for them don't raise their hand and begin to speak and have the courage and the confidence, even the courage to fail, the courage to be wrong, the courage to say something and be out of turn. But you've moved a step forward because you simply spoke. So being confident, I think, is, is, also, being very, is also very important. And then be excellent. I mean, we don't get jobs because we are women. We get jobs because we are leaders. We are leaders who know uh, the, the um, who have our um, 
have our stuff together. We are well read. We, we understand what's happening in the world. We have our external radar at an all time high. We are obsessed about our customers or whatever it is, whatever passion it is that you're pursuing. So be excellent in that. Um, I mean, if you get a job and you, you are there and you say, I'm here because I'm a woman, you're doing a disservice. Uh, to the generation that is following you and to all the other women that you represent. So affirm yourself, know that you're enough, be confident, raise your hand, be curious, be speak, and then be excellent. I think for me that, that would be the simple formula that I would use. Now let's talk about work-life integration, not balance. Um, when it comes to managing your work affairs and your home affairs, you know, Sheryl Sandberg had called it ruthless prioritization. And she said it's a necessary tool for many women leaders, just women in the workplace generally. For you as a single mom, how do you make it all work? So, you know, we've always been told, learn the art of delegation. But you're probably good at delegating at work, but you don't delegate at home. Or you delegate at home and you don't delegate at work. So figure out what, what is it that I don't need to do? What are the things that I must my, myself be involved in? Um, then learn how to draw your boundaries. And your boundaries start from a point, a perspective of knowing what do I want to be known for? What is the impact that I want to create? What is my purpose? The thing that integrates your work and your life that helps you to achieve that life, work-life integration is understanding the reason why you are here, which is your purpose. If you understand your purpose and you probably uh, have the privilege and opportunity to be able to work for a company that is purpose-driven, then you're able to integrate your personal purpose and the purpose at work. Once you achieve uh, that kind of integration, then it becomes much easier for you then to draw the boundaries and say, what am I going to apply myself to? And what will I allow somebody else to? Don't try to be superwoman, which we all try to do. I, I mean, women can multitask, which is fantastic. But that does not give you a license to take on more than ideally you should because you'll end up dropping balls or you'll end up not providing uh, the quality um, in terms of your work uh, that is required. So learn how to draw the boundaries and be comfortable with people being upset about that. Because the other thing that we have as women, you don't want to upset anyone in the room, right? So we keep taking a lot more yes saying a lot more yeses rather than saying a lot more no's. Um, I learned um, from Patricia who said, uh, Burugami who says, you need to have a to-do list and a stop doing list. So what is on my to-do list and what is on my stop doing list? If you can manage those two lists and manage them well, then it becomes very easy for you then to figure out the prioritization. And also something else uh, that I've learned along the journey is that everywhere you, you take yourself, everywhere you apply yourself, you're in that space because there's value that you're giving, but there's also value that you're receiving. And therefore, it's a symbiotic uh, kind of an exchange where you're giving as well as receiving. If you're in a space where you feel you're always giving, but it's not giving back anything to you, giving back to your humanity or the human being that you are, please walk away. It doesn't help you. It just makes you tired. It uh, consumes your energy. And your energy should be a resource that you, you, use, you use to pursue the things at, that are linked to your purpose and the things that are linked to, as I had one of the CSs call it the other day, your legacy statements. I've heard you speak many times in various forums uh, where you said, write your own eulogy, which, you know, some people might find a bit strange as to why, but I know. why do you find it so important? Because it helps you to define what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Um, you know, we don't take time to reflect. Um, I never used to take time to reflect. So I was more of the kind of person of how many things will I be able to get done today? Um, and you know, living that very fast-paced kind of life. But when you take time to reflect, you know, you, you and to sit down and uh, create a space where you think or you just evaluate, evaluate, whether it's at the end of the day, you're evaluating what was I able to achieve today or at the end of the week or at the end of the month or just taking some time off to just go and check, um, uh, probably get a, um, a, a status check on you and your life. When you evaluate, you then realize that, we, you know, we get caught up in so many things that don't add up to the kind of person that you want to be in the long term. And that's why when I interact with people, I, I, I actually, it was not, I wouldn't try to say that it was original because it was not, but it was someone that I interacted with once um, when I was living that kind of fast, fast paced kind of, of life. And then they asked me, are all the things that you're doing when you die and we come to celebrate your life, 
will we remember you for all these things? And you know, it, I mean, I was upset because I thought I was applying myself and being very, you know, diligent and excellent. But then I realized that I was also doing a lot of things that were taking energy away from me and not necessarily adding back. And when I then began to view those things in the wider context of my purpose, in the wider context of what is the impact that Sylvia created because she was here, they were not building up to that. And therefore I started learning to say no. And saying no has sometimes made me unpopular to some people. It has made me have fewer friends. It has limited probably the social circles that, uh, or the circles that I operate in. But it has made me a, a, a better qu uh, quality of a, of a human being. It has made me a better mother to my children. It has allowed me to be able to give the best version of me in every place where I choose to make that decision. So I, I always say, leave from your kind of, the, the, with an end mindset, a legacy mindset, and then work backward. It will help you to choose your friends. It will help you to choose where you want to put your money. It will help you to choose even where you want to go on holiday. It will help you choose what to read. It will help you to choose what you want to be associated with. It simplifies your life.